Legend of Mama Yaya. The original Mama Yaya lived in Mozambique. This is a place in Africa, far away from the Ichi Pichi River. She was a jolly creature who loved children and would go from village to village telling stories. She wore very bright, colorful clothing and always her pet goose named Gouda would follow her. The villagers gave her brightly colored beads and trinkets in return for her stories. Then one day, the invaders from the mainland came. They took many of the gentle, joyful people away in chains. This was a very sad time for the Chamber villages, only to find it in flames, and all the villagers were gone except one sad, dying old woman. As Mama Yaya bent to cradle her head in her arms, she asked what happened, and the woman said, They came with the gun. They took everyone. They made us all cry. They left me to die. The poor old woman died, and with her dying breath, she said, Tell the story, Mama Yaya. Tell the story. Mama Yaya buried her and went on to the next village. She told the story. The, villager, the village elders told Mama Yaya that they were all very afraid. The rumors had spread of these invaders from the mainland. They warned her to be careful what she said as they might kill her for spreading the word. Mama Yaya thought about the rhyme that the old woman had said and she began to create little rhyming songs to tell the story but in such a way so that the invaders would not know. So whenever the villagers had been starved Mama Yaya told the story of <clears throat> old mother Hubbard who went to the cupboard to get her poor doggy a bone but when she got there the cupboard was bare, and the poor little doggy got none. Hmm. The invaders were very cruel, and sometimes they would make the young man of the village jump over the cooking fires. If they did not jump high enough, then they would get badly burned, and the invaders would laugh. Mama Yaya told the story this way. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over the candlestick. And so it went. The invaders thought the ma that Mama Yaya was a harmless old woman, and they bothered with her for her colorful beads. Women like Mama Yaya became known as griots. The invaders took the story back to the mainland of Mama Yaya and her silly rhyming songs. And of course, like everything that went to the mainland, they changed Mama Yaya's character to an old white woman. <laughs> they did, however, keep the goose. And over the years, the mainland's version of Mama Yaya became known as Mother Goose. And her stories became nursery rhymes. And of course, they then began to tell the story in disguise of things going on in the mainland like ring around a rosy when the black plague came to the mainland <clears throat> ring around a rosy pocket full of posies ashes to ashes we all fall down and eventually one day we all do and we have only the legends of Mama Yaya and Mother Goose to tell our stories. The end. The Talking Drum. <laughs> Big Talk strolled sadly along the banks of the Ichi Pichi River. He was in a sad state of depression for he had yet again failed the drumming test. Indeed, the elders of the village had dubbed him Big Talk, No Talent, and he would hear the name in shame. But, try as he would, 
he could not get the bang of the drum. Numos, the master drummer, would tell him endlessly of the great tales of yore, of the great giants, the Watutsi, and their legendary skill. Why the Dogans themselves had taught the king how to drum, and they were very proud of the fact it was legend all along the trail as far as Timbuktu and back that they were the greatest drummers of them all. Drumming is for the ear of the gods, Nomus would say. You must learn to play as though the good Lord is right there beside you listening. You must drum from in here, he would say, and point to his heart, not from here, he would point to his head. The sad thing was that Big Talk was <clears throat> technically very skilled and he did drum from his head but his heart was never in it. And so it was that Big Talk decided to go for a walk along the river to think the thing over and as he left his hut he tied his pet lamb named <clears throat> Baliki inside so that he didn't want to be distracted by play. And Baliki, whom he had raised from a baby, loved to frolic with him. And so it was, he was walking and thinking in his head. He had walked for a very long time, and as he looked back towards the hut, he saw a terrible sight, for his hut was on fire. Big Talk's heart froze as he remembered Baliki tied up inside and he ran desper desperately to the nearest village drum and began drumming. He drummed the fire song furiously with all his heart and all the villagers came out to see what was going on and when they saw the hut they all ran together with buckets of water and put it out. Big Talk stopped his drumming and ran as fast as he could back to his hut. As he approached, Numus came towards him with Baliki in tow. My boy, you have finally passed the test, and you will be a master drummer from now on, for you have finally learned to drum from your heart. And from now on, you will be called Little Poe, for the seed of great drumming has been planted. So Little Poe learned down, le Little Poe le leaned down and hugged Baliki with all his heart and kissed her, for it was through her he had learned to synchronize his head and his heart, and his drumming became the most famous of all in the Congo. And it was said that the good Lord came down often to set and hear. The end. The story of Mo Sam Beak. Mo Sam Beak was blue indeed. Well, in actual fact, he was an awesome African macaw who resided deep in the jungles of the Congo. These are parrots who love to talk, and talk he could even to himself. And so it was that his feathered feelings were ruffled because he had not been invited to the initiation ceremony of his friend Holly Basu, coming of age. Now Holly Basu was a most delightful boy, but somewhat unpredictable. And for some time now, Mo had wondered if he would ever make it to the great rite of passage ceremony that changes a boy into a man. For the villagers were slowly losing patience with him and rumors of exile pervaded the message of the drum drums that told the jungle news and his legend was growing faster than he himself was growing. First, there was the time he had set the jungle on fire and the drums drummed the message of disaster. It was said that it was at that time that Big Talk had finally learned to drum the fire song. But that, my children, is another story. 
Ben he had stampeded the water buffalo through the very center of the village, and the drums were hardly outcry the noise of water buffalo hooves, but by far the worst was when he had interfered with the tribal rain dance. He had been doing his own fancy drumming and rum tum tumming when the huge figure of the witch doctor had loomed over him and pointed with disdain and the chief drummer had thrown him into the river. It had rained for 40 days and nights and all the creatures of the Congo were very confused indeed. <laughs> now Mo knew that it was Nomo's, the chief drummer's responsibility to teach Holly what he knew as the tribe depended upon the masters of learning to pass on the tradition of the drum. It wasn't that Holly didn't know how to drum, that indeed he did, but he always wanted to drum his own way and the village could not abide by that. For when the dances were done, they could not listen to the tune of different drummers. Since time itself, the mastery of the drum had been passed on down from the great Dogans themselves, and there was a technique to it all. Now, besides the great costumes and masks they wore, they also would place a ring of bells around their ankles, and when the tribe jumped in time with the drums, a great cacophony of bells could be heard throughout the village. Now, the dances and the drums were very important to the life of the villagers. They told of births and deaths. They told of marriages and initiation ceremonies. They told of intruders. They warned against disasters. They were, in fact, like the newspapers in some places, and the drummers were held in such reverence. And so it was that it was now time for the initiation ceremony of Hali Basu and the drums beat out the song to the village. But Mo had not been invited. He squawked most unbecomingly as Potala landed cautiously beside him. What is it, dear? What vexes you so? she asked sweetly. Why we have not been invited to Holly Basu's ceremony? But indeed, we have, she said, producing the tree bark invitation. Well, why did you not tell me sooner? Why, it's because Nemo's thought it best you not know until the last minute. And why is that? asked Mo Sambique. Annoyed? Well, said Poe carefully, the last three times the ceremony was planned you worried Holly so with all its details that he was a nervous as as nervous as a polecat on a hot tin roof. So the elders thought it wiser to let you know at the last minute, as there is now no time for you to give Holly one of your famous lectures. You don't seem to see he is not but a boy still. Well, I never, said Mo, strutting up and down the branch, and in my own house have been so insulted. I refuse to go now. Is it fair to punish Holly for your crimes, asked Poe, as delicately as she could. After all, if the shoe fits, wear it. And it is well known throughout the Congo that you have an insatiable appetite to talk and talk and talk. Well, what do you expect a talking parrot to do? Even the good Lord knows a holiday, said Poe. Okay, okay, said Mo. But I have prepared a speech, and I do hope the elders will let me say it. Say it with flowers, said Mo. It will be it will benefit all and give the lecture. I mean, speech <clears throat> to Holly tomorrow when he is man enough to take it. And so it was that Holly Basu finally was able to have his initiation ceremony. And it was the most flowery event of the year. The
in. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Gita, Karita, and Mandy. Karita, the crocodile, slipped slyly into the water of the Ichi Pichi River. She flipped her giant tail quickly from side to side, for that is the way a crocodile swims. Silent, silently, she slid along the rough river bed. Mandy who was one of the dearest little monkeys in all of the good lords of earth, was watching carefully with the eyes in the back of her head. She jumped back to the banana tree and laughed as Corita's giant jaws snapped closed. Mandy wiped the water from her mouth and deliberately splashed the drops in Corita's eyes. What good tasting water they have in the Ichi Pichi River, she cried gaily. <laughs> it's a shame they polluted with such baggage. Baggage, roared Corita, splashing and thrashing with such a do. Why, you chattering little simian, who are you to call anyone baggage? Well, I know a case of bad baggage when I see it as well as anyone. Or maybe I should have said yesterday's baggage. Ajita told us all how they caught you and threw you back. They said you were only second-rate stuff. Karita thrashed madly towards the banana tree where Mandy was sitting, calmly peeling a banana. Think your lucky stars, crocodiles can't climb trees, purred Ajita, the alligator. She had been lazily sunning herself in the sun, and now she stretched a large stretch. No, said Mandy, I think I'll thank the good Lord, if you please. Suit yourself, said Ajita, drowsily. Sometimes, though, I think you chatter too much, my sl silly little friend. Friend, shouted Mandy, awe-stricken. And who cares what a lazy alligator thinks anyway? Well, one should know when to keep one's mouth shut, said Ajita, opening her mouth wide and yawning a big yawn. Now you could really see her teeth. If you ask me, said Mandy, examining Ajita's sharp by cuspus closely. I think you and Corita only know when to keep your mouths open. And it is usually when some helpless animal is in the way of your teeth. Hmm. Ah, my dear little man Mandy morsel, <clears throat> said Ajita. But you are so unfair. Crocodilians do not do well on land. You should not judge us until you have walked in our shoes. No thank you, said Mandy. I do not need shoes, especially alligator shoes. I use my tail. At least I did until someone took half of it off. Mandy rubbed the stub of what was left of her tail and eyed Ajita suspiciously. If you ask me, cautioned Mandy, I think you do rather nicely on land. One minute sleeping in the sun, the next snapping at my back door, she reached for another banana. Ah, said Ajita, licking her teeth, but we are really very awkward. It is hard to catch a square meal. We must grab whatever comes our way when we can. Then you should try eating bananas instead of monkeys, said Mandy, tossing a banana in front of Ajita's long snout. Ajita's mouth instinctively snapped open and closed quickly, but she missed it. Why, that's a wonderful idea, said Ajita slyly. Why don't you come down here and put one in my mouth. 
I am not very good at catching things. Oh no, said Mandy. Ha <laughs> ha. And lose my hand as well as my tail? I'll be a monkey's uncle first. <laughs> Which, of course, was impossible for Mandy. But, said Ajita, you are not very nice. Do you remember crocodilians can't climb trees? Yes, said Mandy. And if they could, monkeys would have to learn how to fly. <laughs> At that very moment, there was such a commotion and hollering from the other side of the river. Karita had gone there trying to catch a jungle bird. Help! she cried. Oh, please help! I'm stuck! Mandy's bright little eyes perked up devilishly. Caught, is it? What is this? Another crocodile tail? She dashed high through the trees to the spot. Oh no, please, I'm really stuck, cried Karita. Large crocodile tears rolling down her rough cheeks. And there she sat, her long snout caught first and fast in a large tree log where the jungle bird had darted for safety. Ajia could not help snickering as Mandy dropped down on Cordelia's leathery back. And what have we here? I don't get a chance like this too often, she said, dancing up and down on Cordelia's back. Arr, 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 roared Cordelia. Get this stupid monkey off my back! Ha ha ha, laughed Mandy. Why, this is a strange crocodile business indeed. You just wait, growled Karita. I'll get even with you, you silly simian monkey face. Why don't you keep your mouth shut and mind your own monkey business? Monkeys are such silly things anyway. If you ask me, laughed Mandy, I'll say it again. It is a crocodilian who don't know when to keep their mouth Shit. <laughs> Why, this is more fun than a barrel of monkeys. And she did another little Irish monkey jig on Karita's back. The end. Okay, now. Gigo the Giraffe. <clears throat> Gigo the Giraffe tried very hard to pull himself free. His back leg was caught all the way down to his two big toes in the twisty, tangly tree trunk. The more he pulled, the more he slipped. The more frightened he became. Finally, there was nothing else to do but let himself slip. He landed with a big splash in the middle of the Ichi Peachy River. His eyes were closed so tightly that they hurt. He was afraid to open them, for he was quite sure he must look ridiculous. He stood there, slipping and sliding on the rough rocks of the riverbed, when he heard the twittering from the trees overhead. He just knew he looked very silly indeed. He tried again to get up the banks of the Ichi Peachy River, and again, he fell back down. Now the twitters became chatters and the chatters became screeches as those awful monkeys scampered through the trees mocking and jeering him. Surely, he thought, they have no hearts at all. The more he struggled, the more they howled. Look! It is clumsy Jigo, silly long neck thing always getting stuck in something or another. A large audience was beginning to gather on the banks of the Ichi Peachy River. Suddenly Gigo kicked his back legs up, but they sprang back like a jack-in-the-box and hit something in the river waters behind him. Ah! growled Corita the crocodile. What do you think you are doing, you silly clumsy thing? 
I am not a stepping stone, you know. I'm sorry, said Gigo. Watery tears building in his big brown eyes. I didn't mean to, to hurt you. Heesh, you! cried the monkeys. Giraffes are good for nothing but trouble. They have such silly long legs and a silly long neck. They are always stumbling. One over two big toes. They can't even take a drink without looking silly. Murdoch the monkey hung far out on the branch, jeering the loudest. Look at us, he shouted with such pride. We are very well made indeed. Our tails and arms are great for swinging. We glide through the trees so gracefully. Who ever heard of a monkey falling out of a tree? With this, there was a loud splash as Murdoch lost his balance and fell into the Ichi Peachy River. <laughs> Gigo did not even notice Murdoch at all. He was too busy thinking how hard it really was for him to get a drink. He must spread his two front legs wide apart. Then he must reach his long neck all the way down to the water, and there was just no way to do it gracefully. It is true, sighed Gigo wearily. Yes, said Corita, the crocodile. And just consider how smartly made I am. She opened her wide mouth. Do you have a large mouth full of teeth like mine? I can catch a fish with one big gulp, she said, opening her mouth even wider and eyeing Gigo's long, slender legs wickedly. Gigo made one giant leap up the banks of the Ichi Pichi River quickly. Luckily, he made it this time and they all roared with laughter. He could no longer hold them back and big hot tears rolled down his cheeks. They rolled all the way down his long neck. Then they rolled all the way down his long legs and landed on his two big toes. Try as he might, he could n not hold them back. And of course, since they had such a long way to go, everyone could see. Cry baby, they started to call. Silly clumsy cry baby. Gigo could take it no more. I think, he gulped, I think you are all very mean. And he ran away as fast as he could. He ran so fast and the tears rolled so profusely that he could hardly see where he was going. Just then he noticed that there was much commotion going on up ahead. He stopped in his tracks as dozens of zebra and elephants and every kind of land creature imaginable came thundering towards him. What on earth is going on? He called out to the rushing crowd. Is it a fire? He ha! called the laughing hyenas. No, no! It is the good Lord. He is coming for a visit. We all are rushing home to straighten things up, she said as she went scaring on her way. The good Lord, said Gigo. Well, it's about time. I'm going to find out right now why on earth he made such a silly, useless creature as me. He marched forward determinedly. Uh, where is he? called Gigo to the water buffalo as he came thundering past. Where is the good Lord? Over there, in the cacao tree, the water buffalo answered. But you had better not bother him right now. I think he is resting or something. I'll go home and straighten up your house. He will see you when he's ready. No, thought Gigo. Not this time. I'm not going to wait any longer. He marched forward bravely to the cacao tree. What are you doing up in that tree, good Lord? I want to talk to you. Please come down, called Gigo nervously. There was a rustling in the cacao leaves. Then the good Lord poked his head out. He looked all around and said in a large booming voice, And who is this that is calling me at such a time as this? It is I, Gigo the Giraffe, said Gigo 
with his last bit of valor left. Ah, yes, said the good lord, scratching his chin. Gigo, the great giraffe. Why, of course. You see, he had made the cacao tree many years before so that the giraffe could get a bite to eat more readily. So, he was not surprised to see Gigo at all. Well, you see, Gigo, he said very gently, it has been such a long time since I have visited Africa. The truth is, I jumped off cloud nine too soon. Now my foot seems to be caught in the twisty, tangly treetop. I know that feeling, said Gigo, sighing. Can I help you? Uh, I, I, I can almost reach the top of this tree. If I stretch my neck very tall, and if you reach out as far as you can, you can take hold of my two little horns and the very thing, said the good Lord. So he reached out of the cacao tree, which was one of the tallest trees in Africa. And when Gigo stood on his tippy toes, the good Lord could grab hold of his two little horns. Gigo pulled with all his might. The good Lord popped out and landed on Gigo's long neck. Hey, wow, said the good Lord.